We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. For some of you who don't know what dispensationalism is, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people and the right time period. So it's just a matter of fact truth and statement that Old Testament is not the same as New Testament, right? So there's a division there. There are doctrines in the Old Testament that New Testament Christians do not apply to themselves. Now mainly there are four time periods. Bullinger, Larkin, they put it up to seven to probably even ten. But to keep things simple, I divide things by four. One is Old Testament. The second is Church Age, which is our time period, the Christians. Third is Tribulation. And then the fourth is the millennium, which is a 1,000-year future kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule on the earth. Now, between the church age and Old Testament, this is very important for some of you who don't know dispensationalism, it's a transitional period. Between the Old Testament and church age, it's a transitional period where it was going back and forth with Jews and Gentiles. Uh, we call that the transitional period. That's the book of Acts. You'll notice that they were switching from Jew to Gentile. A lot of verses that seem to show that you can lose your salvation or do works for your salvation, those actually apply to Jews, you're going to find out, either in the Old Testament or in the Tribulation or in the Millennium. Verses that talk about once saved, always saved, faith alone, not by works, you're going to find out they apply to us in the church age. Now, if you do it that way, then you're not going to get confused. So when you see Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, you know that's not to you. That's for Jews. That verse occurred during the transitional era, and you'll notice they were first ministering to Jews yeah. that time. So it was at a transitional era, they were dealing with Jews, and it was switching to Gentiles. You see the book of James, chapter 2, a very famous verse. Faith without works is dead. Ye see that how ye are justified not by faith only, but by works. Well, if you look at James chapter 1, verse 1, it's written to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's right. And then James chapter 5, verse 3 said it's for the last days, the tribulation. So you know that faith and works salvation is not for Christians. It's for Jews in the tribulation which is why it makes sense that they cannot take the mark of the beast and they cannot deny Jesus. They have to resist persecution. They have to resist torture and death to maintain their salvation. See, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, that's a lot of work. That's just not faith alone. This also makes sense why Christians are not going through the tribulation. See, we believe in a rapture pre-tribulation rapture. We're out of the tribulation. If you're going to get saved in the tribulation, it's not going to be a Christian salvation. Faith alone, not by works. No salvation is different. You have to keep your faith. You have to do a lot of works. Okay, now that we understand that, we come across uh, issues and it becomes more complicated when we come across dispensationalism. When we come across dispensationalism, it does not mean that we chop off, let's say, Paul's epistles. So Paul's epistles, remember, they're the standard for Christian doctrine because he's writing to Gentiles. So those are the books of Romans to Philemon. That doesn't mean that we take those books and then we chop off every other book from the Bible. Christians can still find meaning and application in Old Testament books, in the books of Matthew through John, in the book of Acts, and even Revelation, and the general epistles, Hebrews through Jude. There's an extremist group called hyper-dispensationalism. So I've explained to you what dispensationalism is. We divide verses to the right group of people, right time period. But that doesn't mean we're hyper-dispensational. So you can already tell, hyper, right? They're also called mid-acts. So if you hear mid-acts, run away from them, okay? Amen. They use the terms Berean a lot, and they use uh, the term grace a lot, a grace church, Berean society. Um, but they'll 
identify themselves as mid-acts. So you want to run away from them. So these guys, they claim only Paul's writings, you can find meaning and doctrinal application. That's not true because I've demonstrated to you before that Paul, in his own writings, used Old Testament verses Amen. to prove New Testament Christian doctrine. See? So there are verses in the Old Testament that can apply to you. But at the same time, let's be honest, that doesn't mean the whole Old Testament applies to you. All right? Otherwise, like one example, keep the Sabbath day. Don't take God's name in vain. Otherwise, you are stoned to death. <laughs> we don't practice that, obviously. Okay? That's an Old Testament Jewish thing. So then, I've taught you there were three important applications. One is historical. Uh, let's do a different color. Oh, my. This thing, uh, oh, this thing broke. We need to fix this. Something happened here. Okay, well, we'll fix that later. Okay. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds, please. Historical, doctrinal, and spiritual. Now, I've explained to you that all theology schools and even the uh, liberal divinity schools, the hermeneutic method schools, they've realized that this is a valid method. So they call it historical criticism, and then the other one is theological hermeneutics. Now, I'm not going to get into that. They do not, they may not divide it like we do. They might not use these terms, historical, doctrinal, spiritual application. However, they cannot deny that they do practice or implement these methods because theological hermeneutics say spiritualized verses. Historical criticism, famous Bart Ehrman and other liberals or atheists, they go by that approach to try to find contradictions in your Bible. Dispensationalism, why I argue is a very crucial method, is that it harmonizes all these three that all the scholars are trying to reach. When you believe the Bible is the perfect, pure word of God, then God's going to show you right doctrine. But if you're lost and unsaved, or if you're apostate in your doctrine like most theologians, then you're going to go all over the place, and you're not going to reach this. So remember, I talked about when you read verses in the Bible, you can look at it historically from their time period. You can see doctrinal truth, how it applies to you, a doctrine you can learn. Spiritual. In other words, you can take the verse and devotionally apply to you, practically apply to you. So even though Psalm 23 is not doctrinally or historically to you, spiritually you can apply it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's nothing wrong with that. We have God as our shepherd. So this spiritual application, remember, is what I'm arguing that answers everything of doctrinal, historical, as well as this doctrine dispensationalism. This is the key answer that I strongly believe many people have overlooked. So I've given you examples where literally any hermeneutic tool that you use, that spiritual application is a must, right? I mentioned, for example, allegories, metaphors in the Bible. Figure, uh, figurative expressions, that these actually have spiritual meaning behind them. Why? Because we've seen cases like that in 1 Corinthians 10. When Moses struck the rock, God saw that spiritually as Jesus Christ. The verse plainly said that. And then Paul used an allegory of Hagar and Sarah to picture what? the law of Moses and Christian salvation. He made a doctrinal application, a truthful application from an allegory like that. Why was he able to do that? Because he, it was spiritual pictures, allegories. That spiritual meaning is the only validity to make that possible. Like Paul mentioned before, when Moses hit the rock, that pictured Jesus Christ. But he called it spiritual meat, spiritual drink. That rock was Christ. 
See, so that's a spiritual application there. We saw an example with historical through Revelation chapter 11. It mentioned about Jesus Christ. He was crucified at Jerusalem. But God spiritually saw it as what? Sodom and Egypt. That's what it said. Spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So notice right here, even though there's an historical interpretation of that verse that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, God in the Spirit saw it as Sodom and Egypt. So, when we look at verses in our Bible, they might be a different historical time period, they may have a different doctrinal application, but a person can take a spiritual meaning out of that verse and still find truth in there. So I mentioned that. The greatest example is Paul when he used an Old Testament verse to prove Christian salvation. But remember, when we looked at the verse that he used, he's totally off. Paul's like making it up, it looks like. Because doctrinally, the context and historically shows Second Advent, a tribulation doctrine for Jews. It has nothing to do with Christian salvation. It has to do with the nation of Israel being delivered, restored from the Gentile nations that are about to destroy him. Uh, one verse example is, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? So Paul used that verse to prove Christian doctrine. But that verse is Joel 2. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's when Israel is about to be conquered by Gentile nations, but God delivers them. So see, Paul made it up. Unless, what's his only validity? His only validity is that he's filled with the Holy Spirit when he's writing given by inspiration of God, the Scripture. He has the signs of the Spirit. He has the apostleship. All the apostles recognize Him. The Holy Spirit selected Him. So what was that? That was a spiritual application, see? Only a spiritual operation like that would give Paul validity where he can take a doctrine that is for tribulation Jews and make it a double doctrinal approach, which is Christian New Testament salvation. That's good, brother. Now, that if people have a hard time believing that, the more easy evidences, which I've demonstrated before, are messianic prophecies. So remember, Matthew, he mentioned about Jesus Christ when he fled into Egypt as a baby and got away from Egypt. He was quoting from the book of Hosea that it was a prophecy about Jesus. But Matthew is lying through his teeth if you're looking at a historical standpoint, if you're looking like Bart Ehrman and those guys, Matthew, he, uh, he's taking that verse from Hosea, and Hosea plainly says, out of Egypt have I called my son Israel, not Jesus. So Matthew was lying unless what? Unless he's filled by the Holy Spirit, and Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Matthew has the signs of apostleship, the Holy Spirit. Because of that, he was able to take a doctrine for Jews and find double doctrine, Jesus the Messiah. Now, Messianic prophecies are the easiest to prove double doctrinal application. See, it's not like when you look at one verse, oh, this is what it means, we're done. That's the doctrinal meaning. No, it can be a double doctrine. Now, why does God's word operate that way? It's very easy because God is a spirit. He's not bound by time. So when he gives a statement, he could see three groups of people that can fit that statement he made. He can see two time periods undergoing through that one statement he made. Why? Because God's not bound by time. So when he speaks, he is I am that I am. So present tense. So if the tribulation's undergoing and the church age is undergoing, God is still at those same time periods and has those two undergoing together. Does that make sense? So a lot of theologians don't uh, miss this out in their hermeneutics, in their interpretation of the Bible. And spiritual dispensationalism is key. Now, uh, I've talked to uh, Bible-believing preachers, as you might know. Some of you already know that. So this is, I've talked to those who are respected in our Bible-believing community, wrote books, articles, and stuff like that on dispensationalism. And... So far, I talked to every one of them, and they could not punch a hole. I even asked them to punch holes, and they tried, and they could not find any criticism with this or punch holes. 
So this one, I believe, is very necessary tool. It's a very foolproof necessary tool that we should all learn, spiritual dispensationalism. Now that I say all this, there's one other th way that I mentioned is the literal application, right? So when we look at the verse, we take it literally. But actually, you need the spiritual application. You can't just take, look at the verse and take it literally. It also is spiritually, same time. Now, some people find that contradictory because, um, as you might hear from theologians nowadays, they'll try to say that the Verses, when you take them, you can't take them literally all the time. You got to take them spiritually or metaphorically. That's what they'll say. Now, I've shown you that spiritually is metaphorical. It can be historical. It can be allegorical, typology, doctrinal. I've given all these examples through spiritually. Theologians don't know what they're talking about when they say spiritually. See, they just say that tongue in cheek. Then ask them, what does that mean? What do you mean by spiritually? <laughs> you use the word spirit for a reason. That means it must be on a spiritual plane. Not just yabba dabba do, I make something up, metaphorically. That's what they think. So Alexandrian scholars, theologians, and the Catholic Church has been very guilty of that. So that's why they like the interpretation method of theological hermeneutics. In other words, spiritual meaning, whatever that means. What that means is, look at a verse, make up whatever interpretation you want. See, Bart Ehrman and atheists, that's why they don't like that. So they're more honest. They go by a historical criticism approach. In other words, you take the verse as it says. But then what they've done is that because they're looking at a historical plane, not a spiritual plane, they found contradictions. They found contradictions. But for us, when we're looking at a spiritual plane, the verses harmonize even more, right? So we've seen that. Uh, when we continue on, with this method, what we hear from theologians is take the verses literally as you can, but then the rest you'll have to make a spiritual. So it sounds like these two are contradictory, right? But actually, they're more same than you think. The first evidence is the theologians themselves. So there are some theologians who actually wrote books, and they mention about when you're giving the spiritual application or a metaphorical interpretation, allegorical interpretation, they say usually the allegorical interpretation is to show how literally the author is feeling or the, what the author is saying. You ever heard people who get very mad at you, for example, and they say, I'm going to literally kill you. I'm going to literally pounce on you. I'm going to literally eat you up, man. Well, obviously, that don't mean like literally they're going to open their mouths and become a cannibal, right? But when they say that, it's to show literally how they feel, even though literally that is not the case. Do we understand? So notice right here already from that example, and even from theologians themselves, literal interpretation is not really contradictory to spiritual or allegorical interpretation. That's one. But the second thing is it's more literal than you think. So let me give you an example. John chapter 6, John chapter 6, now notice what Jesus Christ, he says right here at verse 51, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now notice right here that Jesus is saying that uh, I am the bread from heaven. And if you eat me, then you'll live forever. Now, Christians realize that that's not true. This is a, basically, Jesus is saying that metaphorically speaking. He is demonstrating himself as an example that when you receive him for salvation, it's like you're receiving sustenance, that he is eternal life bread. But actually, it's more literal than you think. And I'm not talking about from a Catholic standpoint. Catholic standpoint, they're going to think that as soon as you take that wafer or that uh, wine or juice or whatever they serve, that it is literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm saying. What I mean by literally is not from, get this now, from a physical plane. See, they make Jesus' blood and body in a physical plane, 
Like it's physically his body, physically his blood. No, it's spiritually. But it is literal. See, because when you look at right here, when you look at right here, verse 63, Jesus already answered them that it is literally of the spirit. Verse 63, it is the what? Spirit, spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Oh, he told you physical is out of the window. Yeah. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. But he says it's literal because he mentions right here, um, let's see, where is that verse? Catholic apologists, they love to use this verse to show that it is more literal uh, rather than metaphorical. He points out in verse 55, look at this, 55. For my flesh is what? Mead indeed. And my blood is what? Drink indeed. See, that sounds very literal, not metaphorical. So Catholic apologists and Protestant apologists go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They can't come to a conclusion. Well, it's very easy. All you have to do is this way. Let me draw it out. People don't get it unless it's drawn out, right? So let me draw it out. Pretend this is the body of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, simple question. What are we called? What is the church called? Now, is that metaphorical or he literally meant that? Yes, he literally meant that. But it's a spiritual organization. It's in a spiritual plane. It's on a spiritual dimension. We have Jesus Christ's body. So, it's not metaphorical. It's not poetry. <laughs> you think this is just poetry? No, he means it literally. But it's in a spiritual plane, not a physical plane. And it's literal. See that? Now, you want a, another example? I'll give you another example. Uh, plenty of examples. Angels, are they poetic creatures? Are they allegorical? Jesus didn't really, the Bible didn't really mean angels? Or are they literally angels? Yeah, literally angels, right? Mm -hmm. From heaven. But they're not physical. They're what? Spiritual. They're spiritual creatures. But they're literally real and actual, but they're not physical, flesh and blood. See that? Another example is devils. Are they real or are they just poetry? Are they, you know, devil means basically like metaphorically when you talk about the devil inside you, you know, you got something dark in you. No, 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 they're real. They're demonic, satanic creatures, evil spirits that are literal and real, but they're not physical. They're spiritual. See, so this spiritual application is more literal than you think. So I've shown you now, this is the last thing, but spiritual application, let me repeat it again, without spiritual interpretation, you cannot have a doctrinal interpretation, you cannot have a historical interpretation, you cannot have a literal interpretation, you cannot have any interpretation without spiritual interpretation. All right? That's how powerful this method is. I think it's really foolproof. And the evidence is the scripture itself. The Bible says all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's God's spirit, God breathed, all right, in it. You cannot separate spirit from that. I strongly believe in that. You cannot do that. You cannot do it. Spiritual is everywhere. Now, that's why I'm vehemently uh, urging Bible believers or anyone out there who get into dispensationalism or double application, right? I've talked about double application. Yeah. Remember that? The Messianic prophecies are a great example. One application is the Messiah, but the other application is it could be the nation of Israel. The only way you have validity for double application approach is you need the spiritual method, the spiritual application. That is foolproof, I see it. There's no way that you can separate from that. Now I'm going to give you uh, other examples about the spiritual application, which is very eye-opening. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then after I go through this, I'm going to give uh, a crazy theory. All right? Y'all like that, right? Y'all like the crazy theory part. So I'll give you a crazy theory. But actually, believe it or not, this has been 
Uh, this has been brought up by uh, intellectuals, theologian intellectuals. It just hasn't been taken advantage of. And today's theologians lost track of it or forgot about it. So I'll bring that up, okay? So a crazy theory of mine. But first of all, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The spiritual application is very necessary. And you might say, why? It's because of you. You might go, what, does it, what are you talking about? You are very important. It's called YouTube, right? <laughs> now they're making a you, you version and all kinds of stuff. Every, everybody agrees, okay? You are the most important being in the world, all right? Yeah. Now, obviously, as Bible-believing Christians, we know that you is the greatest enemy, right? So we disdain that the most. But um, here's the thing. I'm just trying to point out right here that if you all are so selfish to think that you are very important, then even selfish people will have to agree with this teaching. And I'll point out why. The reason why is when you read that book, you are not thinking about dispensationalism when you're reading it. On, like yeah. this verse <laughs> applies to a Jew who so has no application to me. Yeah, come on. What does everybody, even everybody does this. Yeah. As soon as you get saved, even before you learn dispensationalism. It's a common sense thing when we read our Bibles, we're trying to apply it to us. Yes, that's right. All right? So what we understand is that the verses in the Bible have application to us. But remember, dispensationalism, what it teaches is that not every, in, not every verse in the Bible applies to you, but it has application for you, right? It has application for everybody throughout all, all time periods. What does that mean? What that means is when we look at the verses, we know, for example, if you take the Lord's name in vain, you get stoned to death. That doesn't apply to me. Well, I understand that doctrinally, right? But spiritually, when I look at that verse, what did I learn out of that? God takes it very serious, his name. So I better watch my mouth. See that? When we look at these verses, we get meaning. Even look, at, think about this. Don't we argue and don't we preach about 1 Chronicles chapter 1, genealogy, that you can get something out of that? Yeah. Let's be honest. We're not going to get anything out of that if we're looking at a historical application, a doctrinal application. The only way you can insist we're going to get meaning out of that is spiritual application. Now, remember, the hermeneutical schools, they're all about meaning. Remember that? Yeah. Spiritual meaning. Even the hardcore liberals, there's a, uh, there's a school called uh, literary, it's literary <laughs> approach. You, know? you can already guess what that means, literary criticism approach. What is the literary approach? It's whenever you read a text, you know, oh, it means this yeah. to me, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm an English major from Berkeley, so you can guess, right? So... I, every, when we read the text, but what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? You know, sometimes I like to raise my hand and give a crazy meaning. You know, well, it means this much to me, <laughs> and then give some crazy interpretation. I did one time, and the professor just <laughs> eyes real big, and she said, "Okay, does anybody else have a different?" <laughs> I like to do that sometimes, but anyway. Uh, that's the thing that a lot of liberals are harping on. Theologians. Pride, spiritual meaning, spiritualizing verses. So, and you, by common sense, do that as well when you read the verse. What does it mean to you? So whether you believe it or not, this is a valid or an unconscious approach everybody's doing. Just as unconscious as Jung's talking about the spiritual unconscious. <laughs> That's a joke. But anyway, uh, the point is, when we look at these verses, the Lord... Think about it. When God wrote the verse, when God spoke these words, he wants you to read his words daily, right? Why? So you can hide the words in your heart that I might not sin against thee, so that I can be doers of the word and not hearers only. How can he do that if he only insisted that only Romans to Philemon, that's all doctrinally applied to you, that's it? See? Doesn't make sense. He intended from Genesis to Revelation, when you read that, those verses, how you're going to live by it, 
How are you going to live it out of your life and apply it to your heart? So there is a spiritual filter here with these verses, even though they don't doctrinally apply to you. There's that spiritual filter there that all of us have that we try to learn something out of it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Spiritual application is serious. You might say, why? Because the Bible says uh, in verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written. He's talking about the Old Testament Jews, the Old Testament writings. Are written for our what? Admonition. Admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's our admonishment. We are to apply it. See, that's an application. Otherwise, what does admonish mean if it has no application to you? Admonish means something's being applied to you, obviously. You're applying the verses to yourself. How serious? It's very serious because look at this example. Look at verse 6. six. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now that's a lot of dead people from complaining, right? Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happen unto them. Now, get that now. God had all these horrible tragedies happen to those Jews from complaining. Why? Because God had it in mind when he wrote down the Old Testament. These Jews were bitten by serpents that Gene Kim, later on, when you complain, that's what I intended to write it for. Wow. That's good, brother. For Bible Baptist Church in California, when you complain that, oh, you know, we're the only Bible-believing church and the Bay Area is so hard to serve God, this is written for you. That's what God had in mind. It said that. Now all these things happen. Why? God intended that for in samples and they're written for our admonition. Mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists, you got to avoid them at all costs. They're very dangerous people. They try to boast that they're dispensational, but what they've done, and this is what you're going to notice, what they've done is that they de-emphasize other books in the Bible that you can apply to yourselves, and God wants you to apply those verses to you. You might say, I don't think so. No, the, you're not reading verse 11. If Medax believed Paul's the greatest apostle, they weren't reading their apostle Paul. What did he say? That exactly happened in the Old Testament, and they were written specifically for you Christians. And admonition means something's being applied to you. And not only that, the seriousness is so great that he pointed out 23,000 dead. That ain't serious? That's more serious than any natural catastrophe you can think of more than the hurricanes and the typhoons and earthquakes. This is a lot of people dead, and this is something you want to take seriously. So spiritual application is not important after that. See, this has a lot of bearing. This is very important. If we see that this spiritual application is written, like I mentioned to you, for us, here's another interesting thing. As we all read the Bible, let's say that Brother Rob here, he reads 1 Corinthians 10, and I read 1 Corinthians 10. We're not, listen, we're not going to have the same spiritual meaning after our reading. When we read, he's going to get a different meaning. Like, oh, I got something out of 1 Corinthians 10 that I'm supposed to take, I'm supposed to watch out for complaining. It's very serious. But for me, when I read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I could be reading about, oh, wow, this is good for my spiritual dispensationalism class <laughs> tonight. Now, you see that right there? What's that? Because the Holy Spirit guides every Christian differently as they read that book. So as Robert reads the verses in this book, he's going to get different spiritual meaning from me when I read those verses and get a different spiritual meaning. What does that mean? These verses can have multiple spiritual meanings. Double, 
multiple, triple. Now take this, all right? You can take a thousand Christians. You could probably have a thousand different applications then yes. from reading 1 Corinthians 10. That's amazing, isn't it? That's pretty serious too. So go to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12. If you're mid-Acts hyper-dispensational, then you're very much an amateur in Bible interpretation. So 1 Corinthians 12. Notice that the Holy Spirit, He guides everybody differently. There's a diversity. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Now there are what? Diversities of gift, but the same Spirit. Yeah. Verse 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Look at verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That's how the Holy Spirit operates. He doesn't operate everybody the same. He operates everybody differently. How many sermons have I heard about the prodigal son? 10, 20, 40, and they're not all the same. They're not all the same. The Holy Spirit works on all of them differently. Do you see why this book is endless? Application can go on endlessly. Now, remember, there's this caution about, well, what about, you got to be careful about making up your own spiritual meaning, right? That's the extreme liberalism that you want to avoid. You don't want to make up something that is totally out of whack. So remember, what is the boundary line? What is the filter? What's the thing that keeps you in check? What's your balance in checks? Remember? 1 Corinthians 2, remember that? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The only way you're going to find the right interpretation from the Word of God is Scripture with Scripture. His spiritual words keeping his other spiritual words in check. So when Jehovah's Witnesses say, I'm part of the 144,000, well, he, they are way off. They, they made it up, okay? 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, that is referring to the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, I'm the spiritual 12th tribe of Israel. And you made that up. Give me a verse yeah, to prove on. it. Right. They can't pull up any verse to prove that. See? When we say that Jesus Christ said that his body can be eaten and, drink, uh, and drunk, and that's a spiritual application. We didn't make that up. We had another verse to support it. Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. When we take one verse and make a double application, we didn't make it up. Matthew points out that it's time about Jesus the Messiah. And then when we look at Hosea, it's time about the nation of Israel. See, scripture interprets scripture. Like Martin Luther said, uh, sola scriptura. That's an objective form of interpretation that historical criticism and Protestants know. So it's called, it's an objective interpretation. A lot of theological hermeneutic scholars, they hate that. They don't think that you can have an objective interpretation, that you have to have plural, pluralistic multiple interpretation. You can spiritually interpret it however you want to. They're only partially right. You can pluralistically uh, interpret the verse, but it can only be done through an objective approach. They don't realize that the theological hermeneutics with the objective interpretation and historical criticism, they're one and the same thing. Only Bible believers has, have this interpretation right. All other scholars got it wrong. See that? They're all trying to bring up their own models and methods to integrate the two, and they're still having a hard time. But this dispensationalism method with a spiritual application, answers everything, harmonizes everything. It's something that hermeneutical schools and scholars and theologians have been trying to figure out for years. They never got it. Now, isn't this amazing, this objective interpretation, which is pluralistic at the same time? Only the Word of God can do that. Now, let me give you something interesting. So let me give you the crazy theory, okay? The one you've all been waiting for. The crazy theory, and then I'm going to give you uh, a historical look from beginning to end, which will be helpful. Here is you, and you consist 
of three parts. You know what they are, right? So we consist of body, soul, and spirit. Now, Origen, Bible believers do not like that guy. However, a lot of theologians and Christian intellectuals, they all love Origen. And this guy, he actually majored in hermeneutics, interpreting the Bible. That's why supposedly he created the Hexapla, all right? But that, or Septuagint, it's, but that's a whole other story. The point, however, is he majored in interpretations. He believed that when you read the Bible, there was a way that you can interpret it through body, soul, and spirit. But there was no, no one ever picked up on that. No one ever really got into that. Now, a lot of theologians and scholars, interpretive schools, didn't really catch on this. But they've already done two. Can you guess? They, theological hermeneutics, right? Remember? They major in what? Spiritual interpretation, right? Historical criticism, remember, is what? Because it's talking about physical time periods, physical people. Humans. History means history, history of man. So when we look at the verse, we're looking at a fleshly perspective, physical perspective. That's why you get Bart Ehrman and those guys who end up being liberals or finding contradictions in the Bible. There's another group, when they pick up the Bible, they're looking at it spiritually. So then they come up with theological hermeneutics. Now we do know their spiritual interpretation is wacky, right? Why? Because they're not saved. They don't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they're not letting the Word of God speak for itself. But for us, on the other hand, you notice how handy this thing is, right? Yeah. When we spiritually interpret it. Now get this. If there is any validity, what about the soul? Shouldn't the Word of God not just minister to get this? The Word of God ministers to our spirit but it does minister to our flesh in some sense. Think about a lot of lost people who find meaning from reading the Bible. See, it does minister to their flesh, whether people believe it or not. If it can do body, if it can do spirit, what about soul? Think about Bart Ehrman, the atheists, the historical critics. They find value because otherwise Bart Ehrman wouldn't have a job then. He would be the most unpopular atheist and no one would recognize him. He only becomes recognized because his bread and butter, his major, is what? Interpreting the Bible. Textual criticism. From what? From a fleshly perspective. From a human perspective. It's all humanist how he interprets and utilizes it. See, so the scriptures can be interpreted. Notice right here. It ministers to the humans. Uh, flesh, it ministers to the spirit. But it makes you wonder about the soul. How does that operate then? Okay, so how do we interpret it through a fleshly perspective? We already seen that historically, right? That's why dispensationalism makes sense. You need that. Spiritually, we already know that, right? We get practical, devotional applications out of it. Now, what about the soul? How, how will that operate? Okay, this is very interesting, but I think that the soul, how it can minister, is because I already wrote out the answer. You might say, why? Because who is the real you? Your soul. If you die, is the real you going to go to the grave? No. Is the real you going to be that spirit that goes back to the breath of God? No. The real you is what? The one who goes to heaven or hell for all eternity. And what's that part? You know what it is. Soul. Psychology is the, uh, even lost people admit it whether they believe it or not. Yeah, easiest example is psychology, study of the soul. And when psychologists have uh, LGBTQ plus clients, 
they don't care if in their body they're a male gender or a female gender. Deep down inside, the real them is what? I don't know, a unicorn or a fluffy green monster. So even lost people, see, admit that you are different from your body. See, lost people even, that whether they believe it or not, they believe in a soul. If they're going to proclaim LGBTQ plus propaganda, they're going to have to believe in a soul. That's good, brother. <laughs> Use that on them, okay? That'll be pretty good. But anyway, the point is, we do know that the real you is your soul. There's your mind, your consciousness, perhaps, and the, the real you. So how am I going to take this verse? When I read this verse, I can see how physically, historically, it can apply, right? Old Testament's Old Testament. New Testament, New Testament. That's where we come up with dispensationalism. Rightly dividing things to the right time period. Mid-Acts, whether they know it or not, they're only, they're only doing a body interpretation, physical interpretation. They're not spiritual people. And you wonder why mid-Acts, they're not really spiritual people. They're very dead. They got dead churches. They don't do water baptism. They hardly do soul winning. I mean, these guys are deader than a doornail because all they're thinking about is refreshing their uh, intelligence physically. Interpreting verses coming up with doctrines. That's all head knowledge. So what is that? If Bible believers aren't careful, I question if they're doing this for fleshly sensations. All the doctrines they know. This is powerful right here. They're not spiritual as you think. I can tell you Bible believers, our crowd, who can give you deep doctrines backwards and forwards, people who watch us online, they know all the deep doctrines, but they're spiritually dead. Why? Because they only took the Word of God where it just refreshed their body, their mental intellect, head knowledge, makes them feel good. Interesting, interesting. You know what that is? Fleshly. Nephilim is a very interesting doctrine, but let's be honest, it's fleshly. It just makes you go, who, who, who are those monsters and why are those giants? What happened? And See, that's fleshly. Anyone under conviction now? This is eye-opening. Even though this is a crazy theory, I think there's validity here. So mid-acts and those who are getting into deep doctrine, they're fleshly people, if you're not careful. Bible believers, what makes us unique, even when we get into deep doctrine, is what? Because we're saying that doctrine should be practical living as well. Right? So we make that spiritual, where we feed our spiritual nature. We grow in the spirit. We draw closer to the Holy Spirit, not just all head knowledge. It's a heart thing as well. And that's all spiritual. But what does this have to do with the soul? Because there's a difference. The spirit can be where, let's say, I take a passage and I preach this sermon to the people. It is a spiritual message, right? And the Holy Spirit is ministering to people. And then the Holy Spirit ministers to everybody differently. They get spiritual meanings out of it, everyone in their own way. That ministers to their spirit. But see, you notice it's still different from the soul because this spiritual, even though it's dividing everyone differently, it still is operating to the whole body of Christ, everyone. Soul is more specific. You, you, and you. See that? So when I preach, get this, a spiritual application from the sermon, everybody's soul is taking it personally to themselves. And then what, what Brother Daniel has in his soul that was personal to him, we will never know about it. In the altar, no one will ever know. Same thing with me. When I preach that sermon, you'd be surprised something in there was personal to me. So it is very similar, soul and spirit, because spiritually it's meaningful to everybody. It divides differently. But you see the clear difference. This is more narrow in scope. This is more holistic. Even though the spiritual meaning is dividing to everyone differently, it still doesn't change the fact it's uh, pouncing on everyone, right? 
It's still being applied to everyone. And they're all applying it differently. Once people are applying this spiritual boom differently, that's their soul operating on that. See? The soul is taking that spiritual meaning and then trying to apply it personally to herself or himself. Now, did that make any sense or was that lost? That's why soul and spirit, see that? They're so subtle in similarity, but you can still see the distinction, right? So Hebrews chapter 4. I believe so. There's an application for this. I really believe it. What's your evidence for body, soul, spirit to apply? Hebrews 4 already. Look at this. Hebrews 4, verse 12. I think I see body, soul, and spirit here. Body, soul, and spirit. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of what? Soul and spirit. And what? And of the joints and marrow. See that body? I mean, come on, let's be honest. I know that the Word of God spiritually ministers to you when you're going through suffering, but your flesh does feel like it's being ministered. It's feeling comfort. See, the Word of God, I really believe, applies to body, soul, spirit. Not only that, um, there are scientific studies that prayer and Bible reading really improves bodily health, believe it or not. So it does something to your joints and marrow and certain things inside your body. There are actual empirical studies on that. And, uh, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So I think body, soul, and spirit, there's something going on here. So that's my crazy theory. So that is very eye-opening. Uh, 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 I guess I'll save that for another time then maybe. No, actually, I can cram it all in. I can do it. So let me do five minutes here, okay? So I can do this five minutes. It's not going to really take long. Now, he here's a problem that a lot of Christians go through. A lot of Christians struggle with a thought about when we look at our time period today, so here you are today, right? Bible believers. Now, whether you believe it or not, uh, is this cut off or no? Uh, all good. Still good? Mm -hmm. All right. So this, here you are. This is you. Our doctrines is not the same as those from the beginning. That's what you're going to find out, the days of the early church. Study the early church. During that time, it was a mess of doctrines. That's why there were church fathers holding councils and then... Uh, they were debating on the Trinity when Trinity wasn't a big deal. It shouldn't be a big deal, but it be, was a huge big deal that time. And then when the Catholic Church came out, so much wrong doctrine, so Protestants came to the scene. And even those Protestants have split denominations. They all can't agree. So what's the solution? Well, the devil, what he would like to say is, why don't we all get along? Well, you can't get along if somebody's doctrine conflicts with another doctrine. If I say salvation by faith, not by works, and another denom says salvation by faith and works, then, sorry, there's no harmony in that. They conflict, okay? One of those doctrines is going to cost a person's soul in hell for all eternity. And by the way, hell is a debatable doctrine already. There are people who don't believe in hell. Other people do believe in hell. So doctrine is a big deal. So no, we can't hold hands and sing kumbaya and pretend there are no differences when differences do exist. So what are we going to do then when there are these, there is no doubt as time passed by from the early church, the medieval era, and the Protestants, they didn't have all the right doctrines like we did. If you look at the Great Awakening revivals, there's no doubt the Holy Spirit of God was moving in there. And there were so many people getting saved. But guess what? Their sermons aren't all correct in doctrine. But here we are today. We get our doctrines right. And then we're calling out other churches who aren't getting their doctrines right. Well, doesn't that look hypocritical if we don't criticize these people as well? 
Well, that doesn't make us look good then, that we're proclaiming that we're the only ones who have all the truth, and in the past 2,000 years, no one did, right? Well, the easy answer is this, and this is a historical fact and even a scientific fact. It's called progressive revelation. That's what makes us very different from mid-acts, hyper-dispensationalists, as well as covenant theology, which does not believe in dispensationalism. So what is progressive revelation? It's something that any higher education system agrees in. In any topic of study, as you keep studying, you find new things. You learn more. You even correct some previous errors. Now, I don't see scholars uh, making a, throwing a fit about Socrates. He was stupid because he taught this and that and that. No, they still praise him as an intellectual. But if you look at a lot of his uh, uh, teachings or his studies, it doesn't match with modern science today. So what's that? It's because what they believe is that Socrates was on to something. He didn't get the luxury of knowledge like we had 2,000 years that's been built up. So they still respect Socrates because he was getting on to something and he kept progressing to where we now know better than Socrates, right? So if that's the case with Socrates, if that's the thing with scientists from back then, from Galileo to now and etc., why not today? It's so obvious, especially since 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the complete Bible in their hands. It was manuscripts all scattered. Then, as soon as KJV 1611 came to the scene and everybody had the Word of God in their hands and Great Awakening revivals were being preached, they were able to read. And when teachers started to give doctrine, other people who knew those doctrines just built upon those doctrines. So that's just common sense. All right, now that we understand that, the question is this. I get progressive revelation. But the question is, there were people, let's say, during the medieval era. And then they read the book of Hebrews, okay? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I, we know that that doesn't apply to us. The book of Hebrews is tribulation doctrine. So we don't have to worry about trembling about our salvation. Now, you're going to hear a lot of Christians uh, online that are going to use the book of Hebrews. Uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, excuse me, is Philippians. The other one I want to talk about is Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And it mentions about the just shall live by faith. Oh, sounds Protestant. But if his soul draw back, uh, but if he draw back, my soul shall find no pleasure in him. <laughs> See, so it sounds like losing your salvation and fear. So you hear a lot of Christians using those verses. And then we point out, no, that's wrong doctrine. That's false doctrine. We believe that that's tribulation doctrine. We have the assurance that once we're saved, we're always saved. Okay, so since we do that, why can't we do that with these people? There were people during the medieval era who read the book of Hebrews, and they were scared about losing their salvation. So then why can't we call them out? One is, again, progressive revelation. That's why. See, it's because of progressive revelation. Think about it. If scientists today had all the same beliefs like Socrates back then, those modern scientists would critique those scientists. But they're not going to critique Socrates because of progressive revelation, progressive knowledge. So that's why we have to call out wrong doctrine. Because that's, a, that's what? That's the highly educated thing to do, believe it or not. They call us dividers, but no, all those guys are doing that in the professional fields. But anyway, progressive revelation is one. But number two, go to 2 Peter 1. Who is the one that gives truth, remember? It's not humans reading the verse and then you develop the truth. No, 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 that's not how it works. Then it's absolutely useless without the Holy Spirit guiding you. The ultimate, the ultimate channel is the Holy Spirit. The ultimate source is the Bible. But you, you're just a vessel. Without this ultimate channel, then you're not going to get it, even if you have the ultimate source. 
Can I repeat that again? Even if you have the ultimate source of truth, the Bible, you're not going to get anything out of it without the ultimate channel, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the one who guides and leads into all truth, not your intellect, right? That's the problem with mid acts and Bible believers. They have no spirit in them. They're so spiritually dead. All they are is just, you know, mental, mentally satisfying themselves. Mental satisfaction. So the Holy Spirit is the one that guides and leads into all truth. Now look at this. Look what the Bible says. Here were people, progressive revelation, trying to study the scriptures, but it was not revealed to them as much as it was revealed to us. Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, excuse me, I was wrong. It should be 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, sorry. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 10, verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Okay, did you notice that right there? The prophets are diligently searching the truth through what? Notice right here, testified beforehand. That's the word that was written, the Bible. Notice right here, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. But it was not revealed to them. See verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which were now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So what did that mean? The writers of the Bible also do not understand completely. That's what it points out. They think they knew, and some of them are even searching more, but they didn't understand completely. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was the one guiding them as they wrote the words. So even though they were writing from their human standpoint, let's say Hebrews, who knows? Maybe, let's assume, the writer Paul was writing to tribulation Jews when he's writing out the book of Hebrews, and he intended it that way, and that was his understanding. But see, God the Holy Spirit was guiding him, and those are his words, not Paul's word. So Paul, from a human plane, might see it that way. But the Holy Spirit, remember spiritual application, you can go double. The Holy Spirit can see that as, well, yeah, that can work for tribulation, but that verse in Hebrews, I can see that can work for a Christian over there and doctrinally speaking too. And by the way, here's an interesting one. The Holy Spirit might say that verse will be good for that martyr when he's told to deny Jesus Christ, when he's being persecuted and tortured. But if he remembers that verse in Hebrews, about losing salvation, that verse will be good, spiritually good for him. So he don't deny Jesus Christ. See, what people don't understand is this. The Holy Spirit, his job is to profit, give you as much that would profit you, not satisfy your knowledge of truth. Can I repeat that again? It's not to mentally satisfy knowledge and all of truth. No, the Holy Spirit gives truth that profits. He will give as much truth that can profit. So that's the reason why God didn't show them everything. Because let's be honest, if they knew that, there would be so many people who'd cave into the Inquisition and deny Jesus Christ then. But those verses were good for them. Well, won't that be good for us today? No, that ain't good for us today. People are taking psych you know, psychedelics and all kinds of med and being terrified of their salvation, and then calling, you know, calling hotlines of, to receive comfort and all that. We had some people like that in our church before too. So you know what would be good, profit them? Yeah. That don't apply to you. That's right. See, the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing when he's doing that. So this is very eye-opening. If Jonathan Edwards, you know, he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. He used verses that should be doctrinally wrong. But no, the Holy Spirit saw that as something good because it got everybody to fear hell fire and that started the Great Awakening Revival. So a lot of this stuff is actually good. Repentance has been preached very hard during the Great Awakening Revivals and some people are trying to get back to that. But look, if it's doctrinally wrong, sorry, it's doctrinally wrong. Well, then why didn't God reveal that to them? Because they needed a great awakening. <laughs> That's what it's called. 
So repentance was very necessary where people cleaned up their lives and that was really good for them. But today, you see people doing that. It ain't bearing fruit. You see God bearing fruit out of that? The Holy Spirit blessing it? No, you don't see that. You see a lot of Pharisaical people coming out through that repentance doctrine. So see, the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. The point is, as much as the Holy Spirit shows you the truth in that book, that's what you should abide by, and he knows what he's doing at that time period, so don't question his method. The Spirit will lead and guide into all truth. So that's very important. That will be very helpful to understand about our past history. So notice, this can only be done because of what? The Holy Spirit. Spiritual operation. Think about it if we never had the Holy Spirit. See, it'd be quite a disaster. So it makes a lot of sense, that, all this. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us to all go home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.